What's up, everybody, and welcome to a pre-draft edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bear. Across from me, Chris Rim and Tori McElhaney, the usual suspects. And how many mock drafts have we done? A billion, maybe? Um, I think 12 runs yeah, today. 12, 12 Yeah, which runs today is uh, Monday. On Monday, <laughs> when we are recording this podcast. Yeah, too many. That's a lot. Yeah. And I'm we've, so over them, too. I'm and, so we, over and we've been talking about the draft forever. Well, finally... It's time to make some freaking picks, right? Yeah. yeah, so coming down Thursday night is the first round. Obviously a huge deal. The Falcons have the number eight overall selection, and heading into day two, they have a bunch of them. They have two in the second round. They have two in the third round. And while, look, we're going to spend a lot of this time um, talking about the number eight pick. That's what everybody wants to talk about, right? But I think the interesting thing is not just eight. It's five within the top 82 and the possibilities that that creates, Mm -hmm. which is good podcast fodder, (laughs) (laughs) you know, because they can do almost anything that they want. Now they aren't the jets or the giants with two top 10 picks, right? That's ideal. But the Falcons have, have a lot of ammunition and that's because some of these trades they're, they're finally going to see some benefit from it from the Julio Jones trade last year. The, the, the main piece of that trade is the second round pick from Tennessee. I believe it's number 58. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, the, the pick for Matt Ryan from the Colts from last month is pick 82. That's the fifth pick in, um, in this kind of top grouping over the first couple of days. And while say what you will about the top of this draft class, especially for quarterbacks and some other positions, this this draft class is deep. There's opportunities to get good players later on. So I guess let's just open it up right there. What kind of possibilities, what can the Falcons do with five picks in the top 82 over the course of Thursday and Friday, they can make some big moves. I think. Yeah. I mean, I think the, it leaves the door open for a lot of possibilities. You could keep all five right, and just stockpile positions of need aka wide receiver aka pass rush um but you could also use them as capital to i don't know move back into the bottom picks of the first round or move down move up i mean there are with five picks in the top 83 overall picks in the draft you have kind of terry fontenu can kind of do what he wants to do and in place the picks where he wants them placed. And I think that's really, really important at this point in time. But I also, at the exact same time, think it's really, really important that you use all five of those picks and use them well. Yeah, I think I think with, with that amount of capital, you have an opportunity to get a lot of good guys. <laughs> right. Yeah. As simple as that. Like, you can get, you know, in the second round, you have two picks in the second round. You're not – second round, you're drafting for a, a player you want to contribute, you know, more often than not. Obviously, in the first round, it goes without saying, with the exception, I guess, to some quarterbacks you might want to – sit them for a year behind someone like with Trey Lance or mm-hmm. something like that. But if you, with two picks in the second round, you're ideally hoping to get one starter out of that or two guys who contribute this season. And then third round as well, you see guys contribute from the third round, at least sometimes a year one, sometimes. And last season, everyone was playing. Yeah, um, right. I mean, that they, is true. And so it wouldn't be. So I think you have an opportunity to get a lot of those guys. Like Tori said, you could trade up, you could trade back, you could trade for the future. Um, but I think first, first of all, with before any of those moves, you have an opportunity to get five players who can contribute early, mm-hmm. just like you saw guys last year when they didn't have this much capital in the first three rounds. Yeah, and we're going to talk more in depth about that, including the real possibility that that the Falcons could be involved in trades. Everyone thinks about going down, but what about going back up? Mm-hmm. You guys in, in in the last mock draft, version 12.0, amazingly enough, <laughs> uh, talked about trading back in like into the first round. So we're going to go over that. We're going to obviously take a close look at, at that number eight pick and maybe what it could mean for the other picks and where there are some areas of draft class depth where they can pick up good players uh, in the second round. So I've opened my handy-dandy notebook here. Um, so we can Steve. say thank you. <laughs> that yeah. was a Blue's Clues that reference. Blues Clues reference. <laughs> That's because I watch children's programming all the time. Put it in not your with, notebook. Not with his kids, just by himself. Yeah, I was going to say you should clarify. You, yeah, well, you have two kids. Scott has the children. Of, yeah, uh, and that's why he's watching Blue's Clues. He yeah, that's watches. definitely it. It's, <laughs> it's definitely not like it is most of the time where my kids are playing in the yard and my wife is still watching the movie uh, Encanto uh, for the 45th hey, time. Great uh, movie. Great movie. We don't talk about Bruno here. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> 
You got me. Oh, I don't, I don't know how I transitioned back to this. You but. know what we do talk about? Windows 11. Uh-huh. <laughs> Product placement. And a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, like the Falcons' final whistle podcast or on their awesome Surface or laptops. You can watch Encanto there, too. Uh, and learn more about all the new awesome features of Windows 11 at windows.com. Awesome. Awesome. So, as we were talking before, right? <laughs> before Encanto. <laughs> before Encanto, uh, we were talking about having all these picks available mm -hmm. and the trade possibilities that are created. Um, I was out for the weekend. Uh, I let and the inmates run the asylum. We did. And then I yeah, come back maybe. and Desmond Ritter in the mock draft <laughs> is a Falcon. And I was like, okay, you guys just want to watch the world burn. And they're like, Scott, it's not at eight. Okay, chill. It's not yeah, it up. Scott immediately messaged us when he saw we put it in like the headline in our CMS system. And he was like, y'all literally, he's like, I haven't been gone 24 hours. <laughs> and you trade up into the bottom of the first round. I was like, well, no, he said in Desmond Ritter's gone. At, I think he said gone. Oh, they yeah, assumed yeah, yeah. at eight. So. Yeah. yeah. And then I just I, thought yeah, Tori was just going to yeah. watch the world burn. And Which Scott I saw the cover really. photo. He saw the cover photo of Desmond Ritter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. <laughs> mm -hmm. He was like, how dare you? And I was like, look, so, yeah. let, let we, me. We let had me. some fun. Uh -huh. with the, 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 the draft trade simulators and stuff. And said, uh, hey, what if we trade it up? And Tori said, oh, why not? Why not? I actually <laughs> told Chris, I was like, I'm going to do it. I was like, watch me. I don't care what it is when we get to like thir pick 30, 31. I was like, I'm getting back in there. Okay. Well, then take me through th the logic of why you would want to trade back into the first round pick. Maybe why a quarterback or another prize player is there. And maybe kind of why, what, what, why Terry and the Falcons may want to consider that route as well. Right. I think it's something we've been talking about this whole offseason. The Falcons having a succession plan for Matt Ryan. Yeah. And it's like, okay. What if you're in love with one of these quarterbacks? I'm not personally, but we're not t asking my opinion here. We're at, we're thinking about what Terry Fontenot thinks is the move for the overall health of the and longevity of the organization. So, what if they like Matt Corral? What if they like Desmond Ritter? And what if those or, or Malik Willis, um, Atlanta guy that I know fans really like? Uh, what if the Falcons gave away one of their second? round picks one of their third round picks and traded with I don't know Detroit at the bottom of the first round and what say one of those quarterbacks are there I think the only reason you would trade back into the first round is if you were going after one of those quarterbacks because you do get the fifth year option and it only makes sense really for a quarterback I don't know if it makes sense to go edge at number eight and then trade up to get a wide receiver I mean I guess if you're absolutely in love with the guy you could do that but I just think there's going to be wide receivers available to you with that 43rd pick. Right. Yeah. I think you're, they're, you're going to get a good wide receiver there too, if that's what you want. Uh, so for me, I think if you're, you, if the Falcons are trading up into the first round, that means that they would be going after a quarterback the way that I see it. Yeah. And if we're talking about trades down, let, let's say from number eight, we've talked a lot about trades and about how you can amass more picks. They've got five in the top, you know, 82, that's a lot. Do you want six or seven? Or at some point, do you think, and this isn't necessarily for for Falcons fans who are thinking only about the 2022 product, something that we don't do a lot around here, we're, that we try to think big picture. But if you trade down, is there some attraction, Chris, in getting 23 capital that you can have maybe that you can build up next year's class as well? Or are you, are, are you not thinking about that? I think I think you have to think think about it but I think it's all about how the scouts and how personnel, the coaches view this class versus next year's class. Right. So if you think that there are guys next year, if you think next year's class is deeper and you feel like if we had five in the top 82 next year, I like that. Like I feel a lot better about that than I feel about having that this year. Then you do that. You saw the Eagles, for example, traded. They had three first round picks. And right. They essentially traded to get one next year. That kind of says – Maybe they're looking at something next year. Maybe they, they like something next year. But I think people have gotten kind of super focused on the quarterbacks at the top of the draft next year, and it's kind of like everyone wants those guys. Mm -hmm. You have to be really, really bad to probably get one of those guys or trade a lot to get up. So I don't think it's a safe bet or a smart bet to say, oh, we're just going to 
put all our eggs in that basket for Stroud or, or, or Young or another guy who's, you know, undoubtedly will become great next year and will be at the top of the class. So I think ultimately it's just how they view the class, not how the outside views the class, not how the media views the class. If they like this class and they think it's a deep class, wherever, as you know, many think is deep edge and wide receiver. If they think it's deeper than next year, then it, I think it makes sense. Um, and you should be confident in having those picks. But uh, Tori just raised her, her hand. hand. Yeah. Um, I You're also up. think to go off of that, it's almost you have to look at next year's class quarter. If we're talking about quarterbacks, you have to look at next year's class, too. But I am also team trade for a quarterback who's already established trade for a veteran quarterback. veteran quarterback in the overall league yeah for sure uh-huh. and i think because of the, you look at the scope of the the league in the last five years and we have seen so many big time quarterback trades in five years time and it is not out of the realm of possibility in my mind that the falcons have a veteran in mind more than building it up through the draft they're wanting to be competitive immediately that's kind of the way that i think you go about doing that is you and the falcons will have a lot of uh cap space (laughs) like over a hundred million uh supposedly so if you look at that you have the money to go out and get a guy that you want you probably will have the draft capital to go out and get the guy you want if there's someone that you love go get him in whatever capacity you have to do it go okay (laughs) we're gonna debate now this is gonna be fun uh when you draft a quarterback in the first round and you're paying him, even if it's the first pick and you're paying him on a rookie deal, that's like hitting the lottery, right? Yeah. Then you can use that money on building everything up. If you trade for uh, maybe somebody who's not in love with their situation, I don't know details about it. I'm just going to say Kyler Murray out loud. Okay. But you know, if, if it's something like that and then you got to go pay that dude market rate, which is, a lot of guaranteed money as we've seen we're talking about heavy nine figures then then you're having to um you have less freedom to build up the roster around you that is the counter argument to what you're saying now we've seen it work a lot tennessee is the most obvious one the arthur smith connection you look at ryan Tannehill come in make some pretty legit pretty fast him and derrick henry have a good thing going um, but that's what I worry about. Now, you could come right back at me. I'm going to argue with myself now, right? Just keep going back and forth. <laughs> Where basically you could say if you screw up the quarterback pick early, then you've made it worse for yourself because now you're two or three years invested in a guy who may not be getting paid very much but is also not helping you win, right? Yeah, but also if you if you, if you you do mess the quarterback pick up, I think the – the, the part about these disgruntled quarterbacks, they're not your, – your team has to be attractive for the quarterback to not be dis, also disgruntled here or to even approve the trade to come here. Right. You know what I mean? And I, right now, I think next year, do we think the Falcons are going to be in a position where a QB looks and says, oh, I, I can go there? Because that's what's happening now. QBs are kind of picking places and saying, True. We, I can go there. They're a quarterback away from contending. So even if you miss on a quarterback – as long as you're building around that position, you have, you know, O-line is, is solid, wide receivers, the defense is coming together. If you miss, you could still bounce back and get one of those guys who will undoubtedly become available because that's just like what's happening across the league right now. Right. <laughs> okay, so let, let's just stay on the quarterback theme here, right? So, and I'm looking right at Tori because mm-hmm. she's been <laughs> the she's been the resident don't draft a quarterback. Yeah. Okay, so... I assume that's at eight. Does that mean through 82? Also, kind of what's your, your stance on that? Would, would, does that change as we go through the draft? Yeah, I'm anti-taking a quarterback at eight. I'm not anti-taking a quarterback down at the all. road. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's okay if you use one of the seconds or one of the thirds. I say one of the seconds more than one of the thirds. But if you use any of the one of those four picks that you have in on day two for a quarterback, I'm okay with that. I don't know if I'm – happy about it I don't think I am I don't think I'm happy about it but like I could understand the reasoning of that um and again I just keep going back I just I think the Falcons if they're drafting a quarterback they have to absolutely believe in him 110 percent and I just feel like and this is I I feel bad saying this because I want the I want to see the success of players at any level that care a lot about the game but I am not sold on this quarterback class. I'm just not. I haven't been from the beginning, and I hope they prove me wrong. I hope they go out, and I hope they have fantastic careers in the league. 
but I don't know if that's if the Falcons in Atlanta right now. And it would worry me and it would feel like this would be a reach. If you're going quarterback, it feels more of a reach than it would be to go edge, wide receiver, tackle. These positions that you know you have to fix and you have to build depth right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for I think for me it would depend on who's there in the second round. Like if who would you be willing to take in the second round if they were there? Who? Good Malik. question. Malik. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think agree with Malik, that. Yeah, yeah, I think if Malik was there in, in the second round, I'd be fine with, with that. And yeah. I think I mean, I, I think there's a I think there's a lot to like about a lot of these guys. Like specifically, like you know, Desmond. There's a lot to like about mm-hmm. a guy who's six four, who's won a lot who runs a 4-4, uh, who can make all the throws. You know, there's also, you know, accuracy and consistency concerns. But there's a lot to like about him, too. Yeah. You know, I think I wouldn't be – I wouldn't hate that. Yeah. So and, – and you think about, you know, who he compares himself to all the time, Ryan mm-hmm. Tannehill and, you know, some other quarterbacks, too, like with the dynamic ability. But, yeah, I think my number one would be, like, if Malik's there at 43, you take a guy who has a super high ceiling. and pe- So – but other than that – I'm not sure. I mean, I also think Matt Corral has had some high highs. Mm-hmm. I really like I, him. I think he. Scott yeah. has been team Matt Corral for a little bit. Yeah. The thing, yeah. I think the, not to go on a tangent, but think about I watched him throw six picks against <laughs> <laughs> yeah. LSU, I think it was, yeah. like two years ago. And then he threw like, he had, I don't know how many picks he had in the season, but he had 11 picks in two games. Last mm-hmm. year, he only had five interceptions, but it just like that just stays in my mind. Like it's the same thing with Kenny Pickett. Like was last year you? Or was that flash in the pan? Or are you – what's your decision-making? Are you are you going to throw 13 picks in the <laughs> right. NFL wow. in a game or something? Yeah. yeah and then, so. I just go back and I think about it, and I feel like if you're going to in, invest in a quarterback that you believe could be a, a franchise guy, that's generally a first-round pick. Right. And as you go through it, I think, okay, do I want a draft and develop a quarterback at, I don't know, 58? Or do I want Isaiah Spiller, right? You know, I, I start comparing. Do, do I want a, a quarterback that may or may not be the guy? Um, or do I want Pickens or right. Dylan Parnum, like yeah. a solid offensive guard or, or an, an, an offensive tackle or another one of my draft crushes, think, Cameron Thomas from San Diego State? Yes, you know. and, and I think that goes, if we're talking about that, it goes against, if the Falcons, in my opinion, were to go quarterback – it goes against kind of what Terry Fontenot has said since he's gotten here, where he's like, we are, I think, draft best player available. Are we for sure certain to feel confident in saying that one of these quarterbacks is the best player available at the time the Falcons pick wherever it is they pick? Right. I don't know if I could say that, especially considering that you also in the back of your mind have to think about the needs that you do have. I know no one wants to say draft for need, but the Falcons have so many needs that you – it's like whoever you take is going to fill a need on this roster. Right. Over yeah. time, yeah. especially yeah. because we've always kind of looked at this as this isn't, a, I think I, I brought it up and I stood corrected. As I said, that this is their last chance to their last major chance to improve the 2022 product. Like mm-hmm. obviously they can still sign guys, but like this is a big moment to help this product. And you guys were kind of like, okay, sure. Like that's true. But how can they help this roster grow and evolve right through 22 and 23 and create the roster depth that is required, you know? And I, I covered the Raiders for a long time. I have a lot of stories about them, but I always go back to 2014 when they were 0 and 10 finished three and 13 fired a coach as bad of a season as you can have. But every week they had Khalil Mack and Derek Carr on the top of their uh, like of, of that draft class and you could tell something was there yeah. and if you, if you can come out of now there's a quarterback involved a second round quarterback right. none, nonetheless but but you, you can find those players for the fan base to get excited about and you could see something being built and that's what we, I think that we want to see right is is something positive being built this foundation being expanded and being fortified of course all that starts right all these things that we're talking about trade up trade down make your five picks and develop those guys and go to battle with them. It all starts at number eight, right? Yeah. It, the, okay, so much talk about team needs. Well, after number eight, that, that team needs thing is going to get adjusted a little bit. Now we've talked a lot about who they're going to take at eight. I'm not asking necessarily for bold predictions, but 
you look at what could be a very early run on edge rushers. We talked about wide receivers. Sauce Gardner, I, can we just say he's not going to be there at, the, at this point? I mean, I don't know if maybe, he's not going to yeah. be there. I, I think if you go really, really heavy edge rusher right off the bat and really heavy offensive tackle off the bat, I think weird there's things a, could happen. Yeah, I think I, he could fall. Yeah, I think eight is a weird spot. It is. It is, right? There's a possibility that like seven, <laughs> like seven. Guy, I mean, there'll still be like maybe there's Charles Carl, Charles, Carl, but he could be gone too. Like, there's a yeah. chance that the four edge, right, well, in that scenario, say, yeah. Sauce would be there, but there's a chance that the top three or you have four edge guys, top four edge guys go, right? The top two tackles go, and Sauce goes, right? So, I mean, Charles, people consider Charles Cross to be, you know, mm-hmm. a good talent too, so he's a guy there, but yeah, I think I always envision the Jets taking Sauce at four, I, yeah, if he. I mean, maybe if he gets past four, then then he'll be there at eight. But yeah, I think eight's like a, a tough spot because it's it, like we've talked about on our last podcast. The the difference between the fourth edge guy versus the fourth George. wide receiver, right? Yeah, is a lot different. It sure <laughs> is. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. No, what I was gonna say is like there are seven picks. Math, which. I'm not particularly good at, but, but you I just did know. some four, right here three. on camera. There are three top offensive tackles. There are four top edge rushers. That is seven picks. You go all four, all seven yeah. off the board. Sauce is there at eight. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, don't know if that happens, but the math checks out, people. Right. It, it does, it, it, and eight is a, a an awkward spot because if you're, let's say, the Giants at five. You feel pretty good that if you really want an edge rusher, you're gonna get one of these top three. You it, you at least feel that that way. Or, but at eight, it's like okay, you, you're getting maybe you're right. All four edge rushers are gone. All three tackles are gone. Kind of the uh, things get weird. You're kind of subject to what's happening ab- above you at that spot. I look a lot at it, and I tweeted it the other day. And yeah, you know, of course you get lots of positives and negatives um, when you tweet anything. But the the I didn't watch Florida State during the season, I'll admit. But I've watched a lot of Jermaine Johnson since. Yeah, um, I like him. And I like the way he plays, and I think he's one of those guys that could be there for you. And if we're talking about ticking off a number of different things, right, uh, scheme fit and positional need and how that sets you up down the road, right, that that may be a spot where you can go get somebody like that. I mean, we've talked a lot about not drafting for position, right, but it seems like if they if you can go get one of those top four edge rushers, you do you, it. You probably do it. Yeah, right? I would. I, I look at it like with Jermaine Johnson, yeah, no, he's not Trayvon Walker and he's not Aiden Hutchinson and he's not Kayvon Thibodeau, but he's right there. He's I mean, not I, like, I like yeah, you know. I, like, I was going to say, I mean, he was – I think the whole thing with Trayvon is, is everyone's banking on what he can be. Like, right. Versus Jermaine already is that. Already is that. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I also like he think, was one of the – like out of the – let's cut you up. Out of the no, group, no, he was like – the most productive yeah. behind Aiden or right, right there. He was the best in the ACC. So right. it's like this, this guy is kind of more polished than, than like a Trayvon. Yeah. I think that people kind of look at Trayvon and it's like, Ooh, the, like the, the flash of, Ooh, this is interesting. He's different. Blah, blah, blah. But like you're, you're saying like Jermaine is good in his own right. And I think that he look, you're talking about scheme fit. I think, and I think that's something we've talked about where he looks like a Dean Pease guy, right? Like he looks like a guy that Dean Pease would like a lot. Right. And if that's, if it comes down to it and you're looking, I think it's between, in my personal opinion, okay. Jermaine Johnson, yeah. Charles Cross, Sauce. I think those are the three. I don't put Kyle Hamilton in there because I, 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 and I feel like you're going to be like, how dare you? Because no, I no, know you no, love no, Kyle Hamilton. No, no. <laughs> but I don't put Kyle Hamilton in there. I think those three are going to be there. And I think those three are the ones that they make key in on. I think Sauce is there. Sauce is coming to Atlanta. Yeah. I, I think so, too. Oh, well, yeah. Without a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, yeah. like, if like those three. Like, if any of those three are there, they oh, would be yeah. have an interest in Yeah, them. for sure. Yeah. I, I mean – Sauce Gardner is what? He's 6'3", didn't allow a touchdown. He, I don't know. He he looks like he was created in a lab, yeah. right? Which I don't think is my quote. I, I think maybe <laughs> Desmond Ritter said that, Probably, right? Probably, yeah. That, that he, he looks like he was created in a lab. You think he yeah. ran a 4'4"? Four, four. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you, you you think about what you can get at 8, right? And I, I don't know. I, I So many mocks bring Garrett Wilson or a wide receiver to that spot because of the obvious need there. But, Chris, as as, as you pointed out, that you, if if we're moving down from eight, 
right? Because obviously, if if we, we're all thinking I, ideally, you take a, a a player like Gardner, you you go get an edge rusher. All right, well then, what do you do at at forty three? It seems like that there are there's some receiver depth where you can maybe come away with at number forty three a pretty darn good impact yep. player at that at that wide receiver spot. Kind of uncertain how everybody's going to pick them. Who's going to be left exactly, on day two? Yeah. Yeah, I guess the challenge with banking on that too is like, what if you aren't and this just goes wide receiver frenzy in the, in the first round? And or that's something. possible too. Exactly. But I still think there are, there have been like 10 guys who, in, in the ranking, like in the, in the bottom half of that group, I would say like after Pickens, when you talk about like uh, Calvin Austin from, right, Memphis, from Memphis, in that group, there's like four guys who are ranked around the same level. You get one of those guys later in the second who you still would be comfortable with. But again, like I was saying, like a guy like George Pickens, who's been projected to go like second round. Mm -hmm. I think he's a guy who, if he played more, (laughs) he would be a surefire first round pick, but he only paid like 24 games. So you have guys like that, like Christian Watson and Jameson Williams, who knows where he, he ends up. Like Scott said, he's, his stock's going up. His agent might be doing a lot of work. Or is, is he's that actually hustling. Him? Yeah. <laughs> there were some videos this morning, yep. too, of him doing... Going uh, through drills. I was yeah. kind of shocked to see that a little bit. But. Which is exactly what you want. Four exactly. days before the draft, be like, hey, man, he might go at 10. You might have to trade up to get that guy. And <laughs> But he, he's another intriguing prospect. I, I think there's a lot of them in that cluster, in that first to second round, that you would think, unless there's an absolute frenzy, you'd feel confident getting one of those um as like as we move through the draft right we, we talk so much about uh, about wide receiver and edge rusher right I, I mentioned running back offhand if you look back at the top 82 picks on saturday is is there a position i know we don't like to do position you know best player blah blah, blah but where if they don't get let's say a running back or they don't get a tackle they don't get a guard where you're like oh that was a missed opportunity like are there any must-haves in the high group the trenches, yeah, yeah, just just, yeah. just keep building up there. Yeah, any yeah. anybody on the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that's period. what I would say. Yeah, yeah, and and that's a both sides of the ball. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's okay to add, you know, to add another big bodied nose tackle, or yeah. I I think adding an, an an offensive guard. Let's add some competition there. You're gonna have to look long term at, 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 at tackle. So it sounds like go get your wide receiver, go get your edge rusher if you can. Yeah. And uh, it's weird because I, I was breaking down all of the uh, cornerbacks. I'm like, hey, like, there's a lot of talent there, um, but that's that's like positional strength at this point. Yeah, I actually don't think quarterback a cornerback is a significant need because I do like Casey Hayward a lot, and you yeah, have him for too. two years. Right. So I I think that the Casey Hayward AJ Terrell pairing is going to be really good. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, so I don't really put cornerback that high. The only reason I say cornerback is because Sauce is there. I feel like we've been beating Sauce's yeah. name into the ground in this podcast, but that would be the only reason because I think he's like that best player available at that point if he right. falls. Right, yeah. So I, I think that if you can come away with that and really um, – Again, it's one of those opportunities that the, the Raiders in 2014 is the one that I always use. I think the Eagles in 2018 had the, the, like they extended four guys in like in their draft class. The Saints had one where you, you can get one of those foundational draft classes that even if it doesn't include a quarterback, very clear, we don't think it should, um, <laughs> that, 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 that you can get the fan base excited in those individuals yes. and what they can produce for the team. And going back to what – uh, we've all been saying, right, is that you – and what Terry and Arthur have been saying since we all got here, you know, is that they need to build up this team to help whatever quarterback they have. Right mm-hmm. now that's Marcus Mariota. And the thing is, Mariota is – got to see what Mariota does. Right. Because yeah. I, I completely Ryan, agree. Ryan Tannehill wasn't Ryan Tennessee's Tannehill. guy. Right. I mean, I still, Ryan Tannehill still not, you know, but he wasn't, you know what I mean? He wasn't Tennessee's guy. He became the yeah. guy because he stepped in for Marcus and yeah. he he did more than was expected. Mm-hmm. But I think, again, don't count out Marcus shocking everyone and yeah. becoming, the guy hasn't started in two years. So yeah. the thing is, is like, I think for a quarterback, it's always the situation that you come into. Yeah. If you have a good situation around you, it's really easy for you to be good. Yeah. And I, I think that Marcus will have an opportunity. He's supremely motivated. Everything I heard about his time with with Las Vegas was really positive. And I think that he's still an athlete. He was still drafted number two for a reason. Build up the team and the defense 
around him, give him a shot, and then in six months, see where you're at. Yeah. So that's our great truth. Um, <laughs> if uh, Terry and Arthur, if you could just go ahead and follow that <laughs> blueprint, I think that we'll be just in give it. A, just give us credit in your sourcing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, Source. Uh, so anyway, thank you guys so much for joining us for this episode of Falcon's Final Whistle presented by Windows 11. Uh, you know what to do, right? Rate, review, subscribe. And there's one more step this time. Can you please go and download the episode of uh, the Falcons Audible podcast presented by AT&T? It's going to be a good one heading into the draft. Those guys know what they're talking about. And then just subscribe and have your phone do its thing because right after the first round, they're going to give their initial thoughts about that first round draft pick. So you want to know more about that first round draft pick. Those guys are going to have it for you ready to go. So again, thank you guys so much. We are going to have a Falcons final whistle draft review podcast with Steve Weish on this television screen, right, uh, uh, right here joining us. So look forward to that guys. Thank you so much for the time. Obviously tune in big week for the Falcons, big week for the NFL. Who are they going to take it eight? We're going to find out really soon.